So I'm not gonna talk about dreams or my dream TV, because each of you have three dreams a night and 99% of them don't come true. I'm gonna talk kind of slowly because some of you are gonna get translation. But I'm gonna try and talk about the future of TV. I run an innovation lab at USC, and it is partners in that lab or some of the companies you see here. And all of them are thinking very hard about really the future of TV. Now, I believe that creativity moves around the world. I'm lucky enough to have worked when I was very young for Janis Joplin and for Bob Dylan and for George Harrison, and then I made movies with Marty Scorsese. And we were all too young and too arrogant to not listen to the older people. And when I look around the room, I see a lot of young people in the audience. But when I look at the movies up on the screen, I see a lot of old people telling you what the future of TV is. And that, to me, is a little bit disappointing. It should be the other way around. Now, the creativity moves all over the place. I think a few years ago, I feel from the movie business point of view, it moved to Mexico, where three really amazing filmmakers, Inaratu, Curon, and Del Toro, kind of changed the grammar of cinema. They decided that the linear movie was not really important, and you could start in the middle and go to the beginning, go to the end, and, and it really changed the way we think about making movies, and I think I would argue that it changed the way we think about writing and think about all sorts of other things. And I was here in Rio at the Rio Content Market a couple of months ago, and I saw some remarkable work by young Brazilians who are making transmedia. I don't know if you know what transmedia is, but transmedia is the future of TV. And I saw things that were combined video, interactivity, game elements, all sorts of things. So it seems to me what I'm going to talk about is not the future in the sense of it's way off in the distance, but something that is realizable today. I learned from my friend Danielle last night that there are 243 million kilometers of fiber optic cable in the ground today in Brazil. Now, none of you have access to any of that. It is reserved for banks and governments and probably airlines. But if you had access to that, you could make a whole new kind of cinema, a whole new kind of way of thinking of what the future of TV would actually be. Because I heard the words interactivity a couple of times today, but I didn't see one person give me an example of what interactivity would actually mean. Now, before he died, Steve Jobs told his biographer that he thought he had cracked the code on TV. And because Apple is a partner in my lab, I have a little bit of insight of what that's about. And that is about what we might call over the top. That's what we call it in America. Here you might think of it as Netflix or YouTube on steroids. That means incredibly fast broadband. And by incredibly fast broadband, I would refer you to one of my partners in my lab, which is called EPB, which is the electric power board of Chattanooga, Tennessee, that has deployed symmetrical one gigabit per second fiber optic cable into every home in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I would suggest that the minister might go up there and see what it's about. Because if you have 243 million kilometers of fiber optic cable, and none of these filmmakers can have access to it, you are essentially letting the monopolists of this country control your future. And that's not the future of the TV. 
Now, one of the things that Steve Jobs really believed in, and what I believe in in my lab, is that artists and scientists need to talk more together. And when they do it, amazing things happen. You may have seen a film called Wall Street 2, and when Michael Douglas gets out of jail, they hand him his cell phone from 1984, I think. And it's a big brick. It's about this big, and it's long. And, and you know, you realize, well, in a very short period of time, we were able to transform because someone had imagination. Someone like Steve Jobs was able to bring art and science together to make something incredibly functional that, in a sense, could be part of the world of the future of TV. But what else is the future? Well, the future, in my mind, is something customized. And I put this slide up with because 15 years ago or 20 years ago, you could go into a coffee shop and you could get coffee in two ways, with milk or without milk. That was the choice. Now you can go into a Starbucks and get about 200 different ways to have your coffee. Well, everybody knows that that's the way you want your media too, right? And the third thing that's different is that you want it shared. You want to have some ability to comment on it. You want to be a participant. Everything I heard today was still about broadcasting. It was about someone sending a signal to you, telling you what they think. Now, it may be that Mr. Inspired TV has more inspired things to broadcast to you, but that's not the future of TV. That is just maybe hipper TV the way it really is today. That's not new. Now, my theory is that everything is TV. This iPad that I'm running this presentation off of, the cell phone that you're carrying around, the television that sits on your wall. And that if you were smart, you would make all of it IP. That means internet protocol. And that would mean the seamless integration of all platforms so that you would have access to what you want to watch, when you want to watch it, when, where you want to watch it, on whatever device you want to watch it. And that won't be a world of fishing channels. Was that what one of the guys suggested? If you want to watch fishing content, it'll be on a server. And you'll be able to watch all the fishing content you could possibly stand. But there's no reason to make a fishing channel, just like there's no reason to make a food channel. And this idea that you're going to have 500 channels is nonsense. That's what we have in the United States. And I promise you, in a few years, we'll have 100, and maybe not even that many. The number of TV broadcast channels is going to shrink drastically. And what you want is it delivered to you on demand. And what it will be will be increasingly personalized. I want the Lakers games on my TV on demand, and I want the 20-minute highlight reel on my iPad, and I want Kobe Bryant's five greatest dunks on my cell phone, but I don't want the New York Knicks games. And that means you're going to move from a device-centric world to a subscriber-centric world. I want whatever I want on whatever device I want. And that means you move from a location-dependent world where something is tied to the wall to a location-independent world where you're carrying around your TV screen in your pocket. Now, this is not some pipe dream. This is already happening. This is a chart of the amount of mobile internet traffic flowing over cellular networks in the United States. And as you can see, it's growing 39 times per year. So, and the blue is video. That is flowing to mobile, handsets, and iPads. The top line of this chart is the uptake of the iPad. It has grown faster than any consumer device 
in the history of the world. Faster than gaming, faster than the cell phone, faster than the e-reader, faster than the notebook, faster than MP3. It's growing faster than anything. And if you don't start thinking that that's what TV is about, you're missing the boat. Now, one of the things we understand and what we're working on a lot in my lab is that people often have more than one device running at the same time. This is what we call the second screen. So I may be watching the Brazil Cup on TV, and I might have on my iPad or my smartphone a tremendous amount of other data, other commentary. All my social friends that I, who are watching the same game commenting on it on their Facebook page. Um, my ability to get my own personal replays of a given play. My ability to change camera angles and watch some other different angle or watch my favorite player. But these things are all happening right now. This is not some pipe dream. We, our research in the United States is, says that 70% of tablet owners and 68% of smartphone owners say they use their device while they're watching TV. So the future of TV will be relating the two because quite frankly, the smart device, that is the one you have in your hand, will be personalized vis-a-vis -vis advertisers. They may not know who is watching the football match on the TV, but they certainly know who's watching the iPad advertisements that are going along with the football match. That's new. Now, in the United States, we're already using social media metrics as a way to understand how different programs and how different networks are doing. This is a chart of social media activity on different broadcast networks, on different cable networks, on different shows, and you can see that it's a good predictor of what's the future. It may not be exactly what the ratings are today, but it tells you what the people who are influencers are watching and what they're talking about. And that's really critical. Now, the question about this digital transition that you're about to undergo is, is it going to be an open system or is it going to be what we call a walled garden? Are a few incumbents going to con totally control the system so only the content they want will flow fast over these networks and the content you want, like I just spoke to a young filmmaker who's thinking of putting something up on YouTube. Well, what if the big networks don't want his YouTube video to flow fast over your broadband system? Well, that's not fair. And so that's what we call network neutrality. And it's very important for your government and your regulators to enforce that. Now, let's talk about advertisers. Because ultimately, even though the last speaker said he wants his TV free, we all know that's another pipe dream. That's a dream that's not going to come true. And so really, we're going to have to bring brands into this conversation. And quite frankly, my experience from working with The Alchemists, which is a transmedia company in Rio and Sao Paulo and Los Angeles and Cambridge, Massachusetts and London is that the brands are actually hipper about this than the networks. In fact, they tried to do some really interesting transmedia stuff for Coca-Cola and they had to dumb it down because the broadband networks were not fast enough to carry the content that they wanted. So the brands are way ahead of the networks and this is some interviews I did with the CMOs, that's the chief marketing officers of most of the major advertisers. And I swear to God that if the CMO of Procter & Gamble, which spends more money on television and advertising than anybody else says, there must be and is life beyond the 30-second spot, then you know something big is changing. And the advertisers want engagement, they want interactivity, and they want this system to change. This is a survey done last year by Booz and Company, it was a big consulting firm, and it says, marketers want more two-way media. 
They want more digital, more mobile. They consider PR and events to be two-way, and they want much less direct mail, broadcast TV, print, and radio. So if you want the future, you're going to have to make it interactive. Now, in the United States, this is already happening. The online video usage in the month of December was 164 million viewers streaming 22 billion individual videos in one month. The average viewer spent five hours per month watching video over IP. Now, some of them watched it on TV because, and this will come here too, a lot of people in the US now have internet-enabled televisions so that you can get your Netflix, your Hulu, everything direct to your TV. There's no computer in the middle. And that's what Steve Jobs is trying to make happen and make it even easier. So you can control it from your mobile phone. You control it. But the point is, this is already happening. This is not some dream. This is not some big future thing. It's there. Now. The good thing from an advertiser point of view is that advertisers are willing to pay a lot more, in fact, twice as much for the same programming on these interactive networks. The CPM for The Simpsons on Fox is 30, CPM means cost per thousand. Uh, how, much, how many dollars will you pay for a thousand eyeballs, a thousand sets of eyeballs? Um, so it's $30 on Fox, and on Hulu, which is the interactive service that serves it up, it's $60. So they pay twice as much to get on Hulu as they get on Fox, and most of those people are still watching it on a computer. So why is that? Well, obviously, on Hulu, you know exactly who the person is who's watching it. You know their age, you know their sex, and you know their zip code. That's an advertiser's dream. This leads to all sorts of new forms of advertising. YouTube is perfecting a lot of this, where you click on the video, it pauses, it takes you to another site, it does all sorts of interactivity. You can go deeper, deeper, deeper layers in. And this is something that advertisers desperately want. So that's where the system is going. So this ad explosion is not just an American phenomenon. As you can see, Online is growing faster than anything else, and quite frankly, it is growing faster globally even than it is in the US. Now, a lot of that you're seeing on your PC and maybe a little bit on your mobile phone, but this is all coming to an interactive TV near you. This will lead, as I say, to new forms of storytelling. We're spending a lot of time with the alchemists designing new ways in which you can participate in the story. This happens to be a project we're doing called Flotsam. It's a children's book, and it's a book that has no words in it. It's just a series of totally gorgeous images that tell a story set by the seashore. So we said, well, when we see kids read this book, every kid has their own version of the story. So what we did was we created an uh, iPad application in which each kid can press a little button on the iPad and record their narration of the story. And then their dad, or they can, if they're really technically savvy, can add little sound effects in with seashore noises, and maybe even you put some little music behind it, and then you send it off to grandma, and it's your version of the story. This is what Henry Jenkins, one of my mentors calls participatory culture. And if the TV does not involve participatory culture, it is not the future. Now, the mobile internet is growing so fast that it will surpass the fixed internet next year. So if you're not thinking about no mobile, you're not thinking about the future. And secondly, if you're not involved with social networks in which, as you can see by the right-hand chart, the amount of time spent on social networks 
has surpassed the amount of time spent on search engines and the amount of time spent on email by a long shot. And that's led, of course, to this phenomena. You all know this, although I understand in Brazil, Facebook is not quite as big as some other social networks, that Orkut is fairly, still fairly big, but the point being is that the average person in the States spends 405 minutes a month on Facebook. Surprisingly, they spend 89 minutes a month on Pinterest. Um, 21 minutes a month on Twitter and 89 minutes a month on Tumblr. So you add all that up, and that's a lot of time spent away from the television as it is currently constructed. Now, one of the other things that this does is because it's interactive, it leaves behind gigantic trails of data. And one of the things we do at the Innovation Lab is do what we call Twitter sentiment analytics. And what that is is you look at any given phenomena. It could be uh, a presidential race. It could be a TV show. So this happened to be the Oscar broadcast uh, from a few months ago. And the top chart is the number of tweets. So you can see at a certain point, it gets up to almost 300,000 tweets a minute. Um, and the bottom chart is the sentiment. And that is done by natural language processing. The computer reads the tweet and makes a decision whether it's a positive or negative sentiment based on lots of rules, lots of learning, lots of training. And it's remarkably uh, accurate. So think about yourself as a producer being able to put your show through this kind of a, a thing and say, whoa, at minute 39, the sentiment turned really bad in my show. Well, why, why did that happen? So then we can go back into the tweets and say, well, you introduced a character in this show and everyone hates that character. Well, maybe the next week you should change the writing or change the character or make the character more sympathetic or, or do something. But the point is, these tools are much more effective than the kind of ratings that you as TV producers are used to. The other good thing about this phenomena is, and I noticed there were only a couple of women on the screen stuff, is that the mobile social space skews quite strongly towards women, 55-45. And you'll notice that on Facebook, most of the games now are aimed towards women, not men. Farmville is a game about nurturing, about building things. You know, it's not kill that person, how quickly you are. You know, you know, so maybe there's a note of humanism going to come into this world, and that, to me, would be a good thing. So how do we get there quickly? Well, one possibility is I know that Netflix has come into Brazil. And in the United States, Netflix is uh, now the 15th most watched channel in the United States. That is Netflix streaming uh, over broadband to televisions and PCs and iPads and other things. And now, because they're doing so well, they're beginning to spend millions on original programming. So if I were you, I would go to Netflix Brazil and say, hey, why don't you put some money into some original Brazilian programming? That might be a good thing, right? Um, and by the way, YouTube, Google has now got to catch up. They realize that Hulu and Netflix are doing really well, and so they want to make professional content. Because quite frankly, at some point, people are getting bored watching cats dancing on YouTube, you know? It doesn't pass the who cares test. So what will we leave, end up with? Well, right now, you have a system in which you have these three discrete distribution networks. 
you have a wireless network, you have a DSL broadband network, and you have a TV network. And these have to come together into a single content distribution system that takes a piece of video that you make and automatically renders it in the right form factor for the iPad, for the cell phone, for everything. And it's intelligent enough to sense what device you want to watch it at and send you the, the stream at the right bit rate. And that will mean that everybody will have a kind of profile, and needless to say, Facebook will be a big player in this, in which we will understand your privileges and your preferences. And so the ads and all sorts of things will be aimed towards you. If you happen to be an avid surfer, you will get surfing gear ads, you know? And if you're not, you won't. And that, to my mind, is probably a good thing. Now, obviously, there are many privacy issues that you're going to have to go, and it'll have to be an opt-in system. But the point is that it's possible, and for big advertisers like Petrobras and Coke, it's going to mean all the difference in the world. I want to end on one other issue, which I know there is some controversy in Brazil, as well as the rest of the world about. And that is, should artists get paid for their work? Now, I come from an old line rock and roll world in which I believe they should. I believe when you steal music, you're robbing the artist. And you may think, oh, I'm taking a stance against that big old bad record company, Sony, or something. But that's nonsense, because what you're doing is you're taking from artists. And when you see that the music business worldwide fell from 20 billion a year to 5 billion a year, think of if any other business in the world <laughs> had crashed that much. People would be up in arms, but they just think, well, it's entertainment. Who cares? So there is a broad, a bunch of nonsense put forth by Wired Magazine and other people that really the future is all about free. And what does free really mean? Well, free works for only a couple of people. And the main one it works for is Google. Because Google gets paid all the time. When you go search for something on Pirate Bay, there's the Google ads there. When you get to Pirate Bay, there's the ads served up by Google. How do you think Kim.com, this sleazy looking guy over on the right who just got arrested, made $400 million last year? Because he put up millions of pieces of stolen content and sold advertising on it. Now Google got caught last year and had to pay the government $500 million, US government, because they were selling phony drug ads, you know, those ads for Viagra without a prescription or what all that stuff that was going on. And the government busted them and they paid it back. So if they, had, if they made $500 million from phony Viagra ads, how much money do you think they've made on copyrighted content? A lot. And if any of you are filmmakers in this room, it's your content. And I promise you, when broadband gets faster and faster, it's going to get worse and worse. So let's not forget who gets hurt. It's the artists. And the artists who are being told that they have to go on tour in order to continue to make a living. So you're going to tell. Gal Costa or Aretha Franklin, they got to hump their butt around the world at 70 years old. Um, that, to me, is not right. So I come back to the future. My take on it is that Brazil has everything it needs to be a leading power in the future of TV. As I said, you have 20, 243 million kilometers of fiber. And you have to get that fiber 
to the consumer market. That fiber has to come into people's homes. That is what we call a last mile problem, but that is not a hard problem. And quite frankly, you have big players like Carlos Sim and Telefonica and all these big companies that have lots of capital to deploy to do this. And maybe they're tired of Globo controlling the whole system and maybe they will deploy it and that would be the alternative TV system. Whatever it is, it has to be interactive. And whatever it does, it needs to make a kind of transmedia world in which you can create a world in which the person who's watching can be part of the story. And that's what changes things radically. So um, I thank you for your patience. I hope I haven't pissed anybody off too much. And thanks very much. You can bring the lights up, yeah. Do you want me to take some questions? Uh, Jonathan, um, I want to ask a question, but I had to do it in Spanish because I don't speak really good English. Okay, well. Uh, um, the idea you, you put there is, is nice, but only about the market. What about the people who don't have how to pay everything, like it's Latin American, where the people don't have to, 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 to pay that? We, we can think about political, public politics, about the uh, some help from the government for the poor people to have a minimum wage or pay on television and internet and everything? Okay, so first off, the government could subsidize broadband. That would be the first thing that I would suggest because not only would that help education, but it would help all sorts of things. And then if you had subsidized broadband, um, then if you're a filmmaker and you want to put your film up on YouTube with the ads that come along with YouTube, it's not costing the consumer anything. It's ad supported. And the filmmaker gets part of that ad revenue. That's the way YouTube does their deals. And so does Hulu and so do other players. So, I mean, I understand that the vision that I'm putting forth requires broadband. But if you're talking about the future of television and all you're saying is all we want is better constructed broadcast TV, to me, that's not the future of television. So somehow you've got to get broadband into many, many homes. Now, here's the good news. The 4G systems that are being deployed in the States, called LTE, I don't know what they're called here, are capable of 10 to 15 megabits per second. So if you're out in the Amazon, as long as there's 4G, you could still get that TV out there too. So I'm not saying you absolutely have to have a wire into your home. I'm saying that some of this could be deployed in all sorts of ways. You could even put local Wi-Fi hotspots all through neighborhoods. That wouldn't be that hard, you know? And, and so I don't, you know, at the United States, about 78% of the people have broadband today. That includes, you know, a, a large amount of people who are working class. So maybe, I understand that there may be a monopoly problem in terms of pricing. I understand that it's too expensive now. But that's a matter of forcing <laughs> the market open. And that means bringing in lots of competitors or maybe making the incumbents who've got it open up their system so all sorts of small players can provide services on a wholesale basis. That's what they do in Japan. That's what they do in France. 
So there's a lot of solutions, but the main point that I'm making is that once you have fast broadband, it makes everything different, and that's the vision I have. Uh, Mr. Jonathan. Just one more over there. We have one question from, from our team. Uh, Maria Clara asks uh, whether you could uh, talk about more about the Alchemist's job in Brazil and worldwide, how it uh, contributes to, to this uh, right. special Well, it, it just so happens that probably the premier provider of transmedia content is based in Brazil. And that's why I know that the talent is here to do this kind of new television. We, I participated in a transmedia workshop at the Rio Content Market, and there were four or five teams that made content that was so good, it was better than anything I'd seen in the United States. And that was largely because the alchemists had helped supervise that. And so I think, you know, one of the cool things is that I, I know if you had the infrastructure in place, you certainly could be a world player in terms of the content. <clears throat> Hello, Jonathan. Here. Here, hi. Yeah. Uh, we have a situation in Brazil. Uh, here, the same company who, who provi which provides the cable TV also provides the internet connection and the web service. And once in a, uh, in a cable TV encounter conference, I heard from an executive that they would screw with, with Netflix connection so they could uh, impossibilitate right. the operation here. What do you think about that? Um, that is actually happening in the United States too. You know, I mean, it's unfortunate, but there are monopolies or duopolies all over the world in terms of telecom providers. And um, that's where the government has to play a hard role in regulation. It's what we call network neutrality, which basically says you must provide the same level of service for every piece of content that flows through your pipe. That is not a hard thing to enforce. Um, you know, and so, but let me tell you, assure you that this is a problem everywhere. And because uh, the monopolists want to hold on to their power and want you to only watch content over the cable for which you have to pay an arm and a leg. And so if you, if you only had to get, say, a $30 broadband connection and you could get everything, you could get ESPN, uh, sports, everything you wanted online over your broadband, then that cable company would be in big trouble, right? And of course, they don't want that future. Hi, Jonathan. Uh, so you mentioned a lot about the consumption of content, but um, how is that really the future of TV as, as a company uh, for TV networks? Because if we're just consuming content on demand, it, it could be produced by anyone, really. So uh, how is this the future of the, the, the TV as an entity? That's the point. <laughs> you know, there's everybody in this room could be TV producers. That's the whole point. Yeah, if you want, you want to talk about democracy, that's democracy. Now look, the, the big networks are going to have to adapt, but they're only going to adapt when there's a gun to their head, when people are moving away from watching TV to watching stuff on demand over the net. And that's happening, and I showed you the statistics. You know, if people are spending five to seven hours a month watching stuff on the net, that means they're not watching stuff on TV networks. And so uh, this is a big problem, but then that means they're gonna have to adapt too. That means they're gonna have to find a bunch of young producers to do new cool shows that have interactivity in them and have all sorts of things. Now, look, they may put up a fight. They may do exactly what this guy said, which is make it impossible for this over the air, you know, over the top content to flow or slow it down or make it, 
miserable experience for you or something like that or choke off the bandwidth. But if you're strong, and, and quite frankly, the government in this country seems a little more progressive than the government in my country, um, you know, you ought to be able to get there. Eu vou fazer uma pergunta em português mesmo. É, eu gostaria de entender como você vê o futuro da autoria. A gente tem a atualidade da autoria é, muito fragmentada. Como, como o senhor vê o futuro da autoria? Então, eu acredito que o copyright tem duas partes para isso. One is uh, the ability of the artists who originally made the work to continue to get paid for their work if it's used. But the other part of it is what we call fair use, which means that if you want to use a little piece of something to quote it, to use in some other work, you ought to be able to do that. I, I, I've just produced a book an ebook called Outlaw Blues, and it has a hundred video clips in them from all the movies I made and all the rock and roll concerts I produced, and they're all there under fair use. And so the point was none of them are more than 40 seconds long, so that's okay. But copyright has two phases. You want people to make mashups and other works from things, but you also want the artist to get paid with some money protect uses the whole thing. Hi. Hi. What do you think about brands creating their own content? I think it's going to have to happen because, I mean, that to my mind, and I, I, I think the alchemist is doing this already, that that's where the future is going to come because, quite frankly, the brands are more aware of social media, of interactivity, of connectivity than the people who are making TV. I mean, that's what was kind of, to be honest with you, slightly disappointing about today. I didn't hear anybody really talking about where it could go. I just heard people talking about, well, why couldn't we make what we already do a little bit better? So maybe the brands are going to be the way that it gets changed. Mr. Jonathan, we have one last question from Newton Canito. Uh, he asks, what's the, the difference between the, the storytelling writing or creation process than the regular uh, script writing process? Uh, you could go to The Alchemist and get about a three-day seminar on how you do transmedia uh, uh, storytelling. Um, you know, if you, if you read Henry Jenkins's work, it really means that a story comes from many different directions, and you don't have all the pieces of the story in any one place. So just take Harry Potter, for instance. So Harry Potter, you have the books, you have the movies, and then you have this huge fan community that is making blogs, that's making mashups, that's making all sorts of other stuff, and all of that is a transmedia experience. And then what's amazing is, that the author of Harry Potter eventually just embraced that and said, I want that to happen and I will sponsor a site that's fan-based communities to, to make stuff about Harry Potter. And, and the same thing with Star Wars. I mean, George Lucas has eventually embraced the fact that the fans have their own view on the story. And once you get the fans really immersed in the story and they feel they're part of the experience, that's an experience that doesn't go away. Think about it. Star Wars is like a 45-year-old movie or something. I mean, it came out in 78 or something, 77. And it's still got fans because people are doing, playing the games, doing this, you know? I mean, so that's, to me, that's exciting, that's cool, and that's what makes transmedia so amazing. 